Hey there, have you got a phone? Take it out for a minute and let's take a closer look at how it was made and how it'll be disposed of. There's been a lot of noisy debates in this lately, but if we connect the dots, we'll see how we as citizens and consumers can change the future of the mobile phones industry. We're at a time now when our obsession with mobile phones has reached a fever pitch. Containing our excitement until we finally get our hands on that latest gadget is nearly impossible. But over time, our love starts to fizzle. Before we know it, there's a newer, even cooler gadget, and the cycle continues. So it's no surprise that lots of people now replace their phones every year. More than a billion phones are sold each year. That's 17 Eiffel Towers made of phones. Just imagine all the resources, energy, and people it took to make them all. So where do all these phones come from? Well, we know they're made in China, and that's as far as our curiosity went. That is, until we started hearing shocking stories about working conditions in those factories. Foxconn is the world's largest electronics manufacturing company and assembles products, most notably for Apple. Starting in 2009, 20 workers jumped off the roofs, most of them fatally. The stories became massive news. What could be so wrong about the conditions in those factories that it would cause workers to take their own lives? But it wasn't just Apple. Most major electronics brands either make their products in the very same factories or in ones that are no better. As consumers, we're faced with a dilemma. We all want to have those shiny new gadgets, but there's no way to be confident that workers have been treated fairly along the way. Can we be outraged at the unfair treatment of workers while carrying smartphones in our pockets that were made under those very same conditions? Or does that make us hypocrites? We could try boycotting those products until they improve, but there aren't any options that are ideal. So what are we supposed to do? Well, first, consider this. Some experts have started calling this situation the electronics industry's Nike moment. In the 90s, Nike was exposed for sweatshop labor in their factories. Consumers were outraged, and Nike faced a firestorm of bad press. But these events encouraged Nike to reevaluate their supply chain practices. They became a member of the Fair Labor Association, and today, Nike is considered a leader, not just on labor issues, but on reducing toxic chemicals in products and using eco-materials. Many other brands have done the same or better, and now, as we discovered in the secret lives of our clothes, there are better choices for conscious consumers. But when we look closer at the mobile phones industry, labor issues are only the tip of the iceberg. With so many consumers replacing their phones year after year, what's happening with all those old phones? In the United States, for example, only 11% are being recycled. So what about the rest? Well, many get thrown straight into a drawer, where they stay untouched for years, before finally being trashed. It's estimated that at this moment, there are more than half a billion old phones collecting dust. And guess what? If we recycled all of them, we'd find $300 million worth of precious metals inside. When we do finally throw them out, this trash ends up in places like Ghana or Guayu, China, the world's largest e-waste center. Guayu is famously the second most contaminated place on Earth, the first being a nuclear waste dump in Russia. In places like Guayu, the recycling is carried out in the most primitive and toxic ways imaginable. The electronics are smashed apart with hammers by workers huddled on the ground using no protective gear. The plastic parts, never designed for disassembly, are simply smashed or burned off to recover some of the metals inside. Whatever's left over gets tossed into a giant heap to slowly release toxins into the groundwater for the next millennium or so. Most big electronics companies are starting to provide what they call take-back programs, but that name can be a bit misleading. Why's that? Well, first of all, take-back sounds like the companies are actually taking their own products back. But what many actually do is hire the cheapest recycling company to deal with the waste for them. And a lot of the time, that just means sneaking it off to some toxic scrapyard in Guayu. Take-back should mean that companies include the cost of recycling into the price of the product. After all, these companies have almost complete control over the marketing and design. Shouldn't they also be responsible for what happens at the product's end of life? When phones are not only designed to be made, but designed for disassembly as well, the scraps of one phone could be used to build the newest upcoming phone. Instead of going from cradle to grave, all materials would go into the making of new products in what's called cradle to cradle. It's based on the idea of a closed loop recycling process that would eliminate the need for graves like Guayu. So how can we make this happen? As consumers, 
The only apparent power we possess is by choosing from the products that brands put on the market. But, unlike with food or clothing, with mobile phones right now, there aren't any truly green options available. So because our consumption choice doesn't hold as much power as we'd like, we have to somehow find a way to still apply pressure. To put more power in our control, we need to come together publicly and share our concerns across the whole production chain. In the past, social movements have proven to change imbalances of power. And with enough pressure from citizens and consumers, the most innovative brands will take the lead. With increasing consumer demand for transparency, we're starting to see the first signs of change. Greenpeace releases their Guide to Greener Electronics, showing how companies rank on sustainability. Usually, however, producers only improve when they feel public and consumer pressure to do so. Our job as consumers is to apply so much demand for a greener product that we get these big companies in a green race. We can start with demands such as having at least one toxic free line of products on the market, or extending warranties so that instead of chucking out a phone when it dies, affordable repairs are available to extend its life. We know this kind of pressure works. Not long ago, the electronics brand Philips actively lobbied against laws that would make them responsible for recycling their own products. They were then swarmed with 47,000 angry emails from the public through a Greenpeace campaign. The pressure was so strong, they had no choice but to drastically reevaluate and start taking responsibility for their own e-waste. The firestorm of publicity that has exploded in the past few years, directed at mobile phones brands, offers us the opportunity to provoke real change in the way that our mobile phones are made and disposed of. This could be the new Nike moment. Our outrageous consumers is not hypocritical. We want the latest magical gadgets, and we expect that brands will produce them responsibly. Together, we can raise the bar on how our mobile phones are made.